Welcome everybody to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We are delighted that you are here and I'm personally thrilled with our two guests. We have Angela Barnes on and we have Jack Alato. A lot of you might know them independently, but these two dynamos have teamed up to really bring forward an amazing conversation. Um, I can't wait to have it. Angela, tell us where you are coming to us from today. Sure. I'm out traveling, as I said before, but I'm, I'm coming. I, I live in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, based with Carter International Consulting Firm. Awesome. And Jack Alato, where are you coming to us from? So today? I am right now sitting in the beautiful San Francisco Bay Area, <laughs> and I'm visiting the city. I'm heading back to Southern California tomorrow, but um, and I love being in the Bay Area. Yeah, I love it. Well, we love that you are here, and we are so appreciative that we also have the sponsorship of some equal powerhouses, and they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Fundraising Academy, National University, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. These are the folks that join us day in and day out. And, you know, we've done more than a thousand shows. So if you want to get back to any of our previous episodes, find us on our app check out streaming broadcast platforms or even podcasts um, because you can find Angela and Jack on some of our previous episodes as well. So we certainly welcome you uh, that way. Angela Barnes coming to us from middle America. Talk to us briefly about Carter and what Carter does before we get into this. Absolutely. I joined Carter in 2020. They're an international consulting firm that works with organizations of all types and sizes, arts and culture, higher ed, healthcare, marine care mammal, human services, and religion. And uh, they work mostly, we work on capital campaigns, planning studies, uh, development infrastructure, board governance, and wow. strategic planning. Love it. I love, love, love it. Well, you can check out more about Carter at carter.global. Mr. Jack Alato, one of our favorites coming to us from Fundraising Academy. Um, I'm always intrigued by this part of your secret life, and that's the CFRE training. Can you yeah. just briefly talk to us about that? Because it's such sure. an incredible part of what you do and how you have grown our sector, I, I have to say. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I host study groups for CFRE, but you know, since Angela's here, I got to do a shout out. Angela and I met through a study group, and you'll see those four letters after her name right now. So uh, we've continued our friendship past the study group, past her passing the CFRE, mm -hmm. and now we are collaborating on so many other great things. And I am so fortunate that I meet people like Angela Barnes in my study groups, and I just say, I got to continue to work with these guys. And she's one of those guys. In fact, if I could give a shout out to our Cultivate Conference, where yeah. Angela and I are going to have the opportunity to meet in person for the second time, because we're definitely going to meet at AFP Icon um, in on uh, in April 7th. But it's going to be exciting to be at the Cultivate Conference in San Diego, which is, of course, sponsored by the Fundraising Academy. Yeah. You know, that's that's fabulous. We're going to be broadcasting live um, on one of those days. Um, oh. and so, yeah, we, we did it last year. And so we'll be doing it again. And it'll be a lot of fun. Well, you know, let's get into this because I, I I'm going to witness to both of you. I've kind of seen this as um, a board member going out in the community, raising funds. Um, I could never give voice to it. I sometimes mm -hmm. would just get this like sense. Mm -hmm. And so donor dominance, I love that word. I, I, I think for me, it's helped me to kind of give some language to what I've been able to observe, but I haven't been able to articulate. So, so help us out and paint that picture. What does donor dominance look like from your point of view? It's a great question, Julia, because it is not, a sweeping gesture, all of a sudden this act happens. It's a series of small acts that develop over time. 
-hmm. And actually donor dominance is a result of donor-centric fundraising that exists without boundaries. When an organization lacks boundaries and they, or they aren't clearly communicated to the donors themselves, mm -hmm. donor dominance is one of the outcomes that is achieved. Unknowingly, yeah. it's just small acts over a period of days, months, or years. Jack, yeah. what's your take on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we see it over and over again from even the smallest organizations I have worked with in my consulting practice where they mm -hmm. say they have a donor who says they'll give them $5,000, but they want them to hire a grant writer, for example. Mm -hmm. Or in large organizations, and I think we've seen this actually play it out on the news, where large mm -hmm. donors talk to trustees and say, I don't like that person. We need to move that person. They're not really representing the values that I have. Or even in programmatic things. Angela, I'm sure you've seen it in programmatic things where they say, hey, you're running this uh, social service program. Here is, you know, $100,000 or $250,000 to add something onto it. And each of those things results in a problem for the nonprofit organization. Maybe it's mission creep, where you're doing something other than what your original mission was. Or maybe it's just this uncomfortable feeling that uh, CEOs and chief development officers feel that, wow, I'm stuck with this major gift donor who is really dictating a lot. So let me play devil's advocate a little bit on this because, you know, we are taught from day one, vote with your dollars, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, even a little kid is taught, you know, when you go and you spend your babysitting money on bazooka bubble gum, oh my God, I just dated myself. <laughs> you know, you're, you're voting with your dollars. And so I feel like that ethos kind of like, creeps in or leaks into the nonprofit sector. And I'm wondering if donors even understand this. I mean, Angela, you, I'm going to have you kind of repeat what you said is that it's a lot of small acts. And would you think that most people don't even know that this is occurring? It is. And when, and by the time they look up, they think that, oh my gosh, I'm unlucky. I'm experiencing bad luck. This happened out of nowhere. Whereas if you trace the steps that led up to the big act, you'll notice it was small daily activities that led up to that. And Julia, you bring up a really great point. Um, Donor-centric fundraising centers the donor. Mm -hmm. To do that, you have to have organizational boundaries in place so the donor understands how to behave with the organization's clients, staff, leadership, paid and unpaid, volunteers. Without that clear communication in place, expectations swell, all right? And right. that's where Jack and I have found the bulk of the challenges where a donor has crossed the line they were not aware existed. Interest, I love it. They crossed a line that they did not know existed. Mm -mm. Okay, that's like a, that's a mind blower because... That's pretty dicey. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> Jack, how do you, how do you do that dance? How do yeah. you, how do you like discuss it, educate, yeah. eliminate? Like, what does that look like? Or do you just have well, to say, we're going to leave that, that money is going to go, that money's going to work. Well, that sometimes I think you have to say that we cannot take that money mm -hmm. because of, of the impact that it has on mission. Uh, the mission, the the impact that it has on the values of the organization. I mean, certainly in my experience working in healthcare, there were many instances where we would not accept a gift. For example, in healthcare, you don't accept gifts from maybe tobacco. I was going to say tobacco. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and so I remember early on in my career, I would say, "But they're going to give us a lot of money," Funny. and 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 the administration would say, "That doesn't matter." because they are part of the problem of why people are here in the hospital or alcohol companies. You know, I mean, there are several things that uh, organizations that may not accept gifts from certain things. So this, I mean, we've been doing this in a way, but what I think Angela and I are talking about is, you know, she mentions boundaries and that's such an important thing. 
organizations have to establish boundaries. Okay. Otherwise, they're going to be pulled here and pulled there. It's going to affect their programs, their staffing, their mm -hmm. mission, their own values as an organization. You know, all of those okay. things are going to be affected. Yeah, they'll be changed. So, Angela, let's say I'm a donor and I come to you and I think I'm really helping you out because I'm going to say, hey, Miss Barnes, I love what you're doing. And I have an extra $20,000 that will help you hire a part-time person to do X. And that's that hasn't really been on your radar. That's not what's in your strategic plan. What do you do? Like, how do you how do you help educate me or politely turn it away? I mean, what's your response on that to me as a donor? So we take a couple of steps back, Julia, and in the midst of our conversation of developing relationships, I revealed something to you that we have called a donor code of ethics. So it's a natural extension of the donor uh, bill of rights that AFP has in place. It has been our guiding star for these years. Mm -hmm. Jack and I are taking that full circle, so it's a cycle. The Donor Code of Ethics um, explains what the organization explain, expects of the donor, whereas mm -hmm. the Donor Bill of Rights explains what the donor can expect of the organization. Yeah. yeah. So that cycle is understood. So we're gonna, we're, we'll probably sit down and talk about that sometime in the middle of our building a relationship no. and the gift acceptance policy will also have language in there that Jack and I have been talking about. Most nonprofits have one, but have they been reviewed recently? Are they bulletproof? Yeah. What's involved? Um, and I, I also want to just back up a second and say the very nature of fundraisers, we attract a lot of people pleasers in this industry or we turn into people pleasers. So yeah. Team. Julia, let's look at the power dynamic here. I'm an African-American woman. You're a white woman. You tell me you're coming in and you're going to give me X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. If we don't have a communications plan in place as an organization that is embedded within our culture of philanthropy, my CEO may have told you something different yep. that ties my hands that yep. I have to go along with this gift. Right. Or maybe the board chair. Yep. So we're not all on the same page. So we lack boundaries, we're people pleasers, and we don't have a communication strategy in place. And that's yeah. what Jack and I are going to discuss at AFPI Con in yeah. Toronto. How I love it. it couldn't get that far, Julia. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I'm going to add in, I you know, because I'm a white woman, I would add in white savior complex. Yeah, exactly. This, con this concept yeah. that's like, oh, I've made all this money and I know the thing and I'm, you know, a big corporate titan or whatever. And I'm here to solve your problems. I don't really know. I've never walked that journey, but I'm smarter than everyone because yeah. I have a better checkbook. You I know, mean, you know, Julia, the question you asked Arn, uh, Angela is a great one. And I asked that same question. I asked students in, in seminars and things. A donor comes to you and they say, here's $40,000, mm -hmm. but I want you to do this with the $40,000. And mm -hmm. you're sitting there and you're saying, that's not part of our mission. That's not part of our program services, you know, and I say, I say to people, what would you do? And you know how many, the percentage of people say, accept the money, the gift. Yeah. accept the gift, accept the gift, and then make it happen for that donor. You know, that is just wrong in my opinion, because it, 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 it moves the mission and it moves the programs and it moves the whole organization to something just based on money. You know, and I think what we see with uh, the problems, not only with a donor centric model of fundraising is that, yeah, accept the money. The donor is at the top of the pyramid or even a culture of philanthropy. Listen, I've taught this guy. I've said to people, here's what a culture of philanthropy is. Money moves mission. Right. I mean, we've heard that before, and and a culture of philanthropy is everyone in the organization understands the importance of getting money. Well, Angela and I are saying, let's look at that. Mm -hmm. Let's look at that donor-centric model. Let's look at what we've been talking about, a culture of philanthropy, and see what the problems are, the downside. So let me ask both of you, and again, this is a real vulnerable question. Have you in your careers been on the other side of that desk where 
you've been faced with this and you've had to navigate it. And what did that look like? Angela, we'll start with you. Hot seat, put your catcher's mitt up. <laughs> so probably uh, an example that we were able to um, work around comes to mind. It was um, before the pandemic, an individual was going to gift a client about a hundred thousand dollars, this nonprofit client of mine. Mm -hmm. And it came with changing, not the programming, but the process of how they would help yeah. the members of the community that this organization served, which in turn would change the mission. Wow. And I sat down with a couple of, of board members and I said, you know, if an individual has concerns about how you run your business, that's one thing, because a nonprofit is a business. Yep. But when an individual wants to change your business, first of all, you're probably unlikely going to change that person's mind. And two, we need to be considered a gift because you're creating someone who's going to think they're in charge because they changed their business model. That's right. That's right. And uh, at the board member, you know, had a background in finance, had ran his own firm and said, no, 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 no. I'm going to build this elaborate spreadsheet. I'm going to sit down and he's going to see things our way. That did not happen. No. So luckily, the uh, board chair and the ED, the executive director, stepped in and said, we can't accept this gift because that ED was fabulous. He said, we do X, Y, Z. Anything else is outside of our mission. Right. Now, not all of my stories end on that note. There are <laughs> other times when uh, staff members have been asked to look the other way. Yeah. There are other times when, um, I, I like to put this out there, Jack. I don't know if we discussed this. Board members can become dominant donors. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've seen oh, yeah. board members. Um, yeah. I've seen board members that are adamant about either having a function, a gala, a program, helping out this person in the community because they have a, their personal relationship with them. I've seen um, a leadership teams have different conversations with potential donors than the advancement team. Mm -hmm. No communication strategy in place. Maybe the stewardship plan was not in place. Right. So one donor received something that was spectacular. It was not written anywhere that we were going to do this. And other donors feel left out because they gave a gift that was even more and, and didn't receive that. So n numerous examples, but Jack, go ahead. I'm sure. Yeah. Listen, I, I have two examples. Uh, one is working in Northern California at a social service agency and someone wanted to give us a, a piece of land in, in Texas. Oh, oh God. And oh, I God. turned the gift down. I said, well, we're not in Texas. We can't, we don't know anything about the land. We're not there. And I got to tell you guys, I went to a board meeting and two board members chastised me yeah. for mm -hmm. not accepting mm -hmm. the gift that mm -hmm. I should have accepted the gift. And then they would have figured out how to do it. But that was outside of, of our gift acceptance policies. Mm -hmm. The other thing is when someone wanted to leave a large bequest specifically for a program that we did not have. And Julia asked, how do you handle it? I remember yeah. sitting there thinking, well, I'm going to give up this huge bequest because we don't have a program. But what I said to the donors, let me help you find an organization who will, could accept this gift, who does this type of work and built a relationship with him and, you know, uh, nurtured him and went with him to meet with that other organization. That's a good relationship thing. But both of those gifts, uh, you know, people said, why would you accept it? It's, and the reason I always say, it's not just about money, guys. Yeah. It can't just be about the money. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an absolute, I want to say this is a brave conversation for the two of you to, you know, bring forward to us and, and really help us frame up some of the things that are going on, but we don't have the language for it, or we don't talk about it, or we have these external pressures, you know, as my mother says, the wolves are at the door. And so you got to get the money in, get the money in. And you know, that pressure, yeah. can you share a little bit more about 
where you're going to be presenting this information. You you briefly mentioned it, but I really want um, people to understand how they can get more of your thought leadership on this. So we're presenting this for the first time at AFP Icon in Toronto, April 7th at 9.15 a.m., I believe, Jack. Yeah, it's 9.15. Uh, so, so I think, is that the day of the eclipse? I don't <laughs> well, well, I, I see that AFP has, has changed their schedule around right, so that we right. can go out and watch the eclipse, Cliff. which I, I'm going to have to figure out what kind of glasses I have to wear, uh, yeah. Julia and Angela. Yeah. I'm not sure. You'll have to do the paper plate with the little dot and turn your back uh -huh. off and that whole thing. Then run back in for another session. Um, yeah. what's, in, what's interesting about our, our presentation is, Julia, we're hoping to open the doors for a, dis, a deeper discussion. Yeah. that individuals can have with subject matter experts in this lane. We are not subject matter experts on community-centric fundraising, but we right. know people who are. So we're going to pass out a resource list afterwards where they can read articles and they can tune in to people who are experts on how to create a hybrid model that we're recommending that would help people protect the organization, protect the staff, and protect the donors. Yeah. You know, I think I think that we're we we want to forward a conversation about a donor code of ethics. Mm -hmm. We have every organ AHP, the Association of Healthcare Philanthropy, AFP, CASE, all have ethical standards. And I think now we're saying maybe we need some guidelines that we would hand to our donor, something that would be on our website. Yeah. And so we're go we're gonna be trying to get that conversation going. You know, I, I and Angela knows this because I've, I got an email from someone in Australia who is coming to AFP Icon in Toronto. And he said, I wanna meet with you guys. I wanna hear more about this, you know, other than what you're presenting. So it's kind of lighting a fire. What do you think, Angela? Are we, are we lighting a fire under fundraisers? I, I think we're, we are, um... We're helping fundraisers have a very difficult conversation. And like Julia yeah. said, yeah. put language to the icky feeling that they've been feeling when a, a donor walks into the room and, and the staff are avoiding that person because something's happened that has not yeah. been talked about. Right. Or um, my generation of fundraisers, our generation of fundraisers, who have gone along with certain behaviors because we felt we had to because one, we're people pleasers. Two, that was how we closed the gift or yeah. kept another gift coming. Yeah. Um, and we want to emphasize, there's nothing wrong with donor-centric fundraising. Nope. We love that model. Jack teaches that in the CFRE classes. Yeah. I work with that with my clients. I've, I've implemented that as an in interim role, as development director, as a vice chancellor. But when it does not, when it's not contained within a system that has boundaries, it can go off the rails fast. Yeah. So we'd like to see a hybrid model that uses other fundraising formats along yeah. with the big, we're, we're calling the big three management tools that if an organization has in place, donor-centered fundraising is a beautiful thing. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, the thing is, I know people, fundraisers say, oh my gosh, I'm worried about how donors are going to deal with this. Like if we give them a code of ethics, let me tell you something, donors respect you. If you've built a solid relationship with them, mm -hmm. they're going to want you to bring this conversation to them. They're going to want to hear from you. Not all of them. Some are going to be, you know, say, no, I don't want to do that. I think that's too much. But the majority of them, let's trust them. Let's trust our donors to have this conversation. They share our values. They share our vision. They share our mission. Let's not be afraid to bring that community-centric conversation to them or donor dominance conversation to them or any of the problems that we might see mm -hmm. in fundraising. And they will embrace a code of, uh, code of ethics. I really believe that. And, and, and can I piggyback off of that, Jack? Sure. Donors are interested in the community-centric fundraising model because they have the opportunity to collaborate with residents of the communities that the organization serves. That's right. When we get into Generation X millennials and other generations, 
they want to talk to the program officers. They want to talk to the recipients mm -hmm. of your programming. They don't necessarily want to talk to the fundraiser. So inviting members of the communities that you serve to the table to have certain conversations, they're yep. excited. They want yep. to see what their efforts are doing. Right. And I think to your point, Angela, that as we have learned from Fundraising Academy, that's the trajectory of success when it yep. comes to relationship management. It's not a one and done. And, and I think um, I've been a part of boards that have had the discussion about turning away funding from a very wealthy donor who uh, made their money in something that was antithetical to what the mission of the organization. Yeah. yeah. Brutal million dollar gift. And yeah. I mean, it was, it was a fascinating time in my life to be a part of this, no. but bad business is bad business, right? I mean, if, if, if you get the check, you still have to steward that. And so yep. if you're bringing in something that has been fraught with a lot of tension and a lot of problems, that's not going to go away the minute you cash the check, right? right. It's no. only going to get it, bigger. It just begins, yeah. Julia. It yeah. just begins. A never ending spiral. You know, the, the thing is that, you know, yes, money fuels mission, but so many other things fuel our mission. We fuel it as fundraisers. Our program staff fuels it. Our board members fuel it. And our leadership in the organization, all of those things work together to bring about a change in things that we are trying to impact in our communities, whether it's social services or the arts or animal welfare, whatever it is, those ingredients come together to do good. Absolutely. Um, and we are... You spoke about the savior, the hero complex. We're going to touch on that too, Julia, yep. within uh, our presentation. We're recommending that instead of seeing, there's nothing wrong with centering the donor as the hero of a story, but not the hero of the organization or the hero that's going to save a community. Yeah. It's very different. Developing partners that will help carry out the mission of the organization yeah. is a healthier way of looking at that. Yeah. So because if a donor feels that their only purpose is to cut a check, that's it. You yeah. take power and influence and in them lending that and their time and their talent off the table when we're just focused on the act of solicitation and closing the deal. It's about building a relationship. Yeah. And the, and the hero of these stories is the family that moves from being unhoused to finding a home. The child who learns to draw at the mm -hmm. art museum the that the goes hero. through the class. All of those things, they're the heroes. And everybody else, the fundraiser, the donor, the staff, the program officers, mm -hmm. we're all supporting characters. All supporting yeah. actors. We're all supporting actors. Exactly. Oh, my God. All supporting well, the two of you are the heroes of the nonprofit show. Let me tell you, Angela Barnes, MBA, CFRE with Carter, Carter Global. Check them out. It's a fascinating um, approach. And I'm going to say menu of services that Carter helps guide um, our nonprofits and NGOs across the planet. Very, very interesting work. Jack Alato, CFRE, of course, Fundraising Academy, one of the, the big minds I, over there, I, I like to Thank say, you. at Fundraising Academy. The two of you are going to be presenting this, and we only have 30 minutes today. You're going to go into some more things uh, in depth. Again, April 7th, 9.15 a.m. in Toronto at the AFP ICON conference. Did I get that yep. right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Julia, I have a question for you. Are we going to see you at Cultivate in early May? You know, I'm speaking at another conference uh -oh. in uh, oh. Boston. Okay. I know. And I had I had uh, I had made that commitment uh, a long time ago. But uh, Meredith Terrian will be there broadcasting live. Nice. Along with all of you and all your teams. So um, the nonprofit show will be there. I will not be there. I will be at, at another conference, like I said, across okay. the other, on the other ocean. Well, we're we're gonna get together. We're the three of us are gonna get together one of these days at the yeah. same place. Absolutely. Well, the two of you are just um gems in our sector, and I am so grateful that you are out there 
doing the heavy lift, having the difficult conversations, and really helping us to grow our sector that uh, impacts us all. And so thank you, thank you, thank you for this thought leadership. And thank you to our presenting sponsors. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Staffing Boutique, Your Part-Time Controller, 180 Management Group, Funding Academy at National University, JM. <laughs> <laughs> Nacho, Nacho Alato supports that. JMT Consulting, Nonprofit <laughs> Nerd, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Um, again, these are the folks that, that allow us to have these conversations, and they're not always easy, but they are incredibly, incredibly important. I cannot wait to hear what your experiences are after you make this presentation. I think you're going to, both of you are going to shake things up. And, and people are going to come out of the woodwork with their stories and their thoughts and their responses. And so um, we might need to get you back on as a follow up, because this is such sure. I think this is such a, um, a point in our culture with this yep. massive transference of wealth that we are mm -hmm. in the middle of in the United mm -hmm. States. A 90 trillion dollar transference of wealth. It's, it's been estimated. Um, I think it's actually larger than that. And so this is a real concern and um, it's been brilliant to have you on. You know, every day we end the nonprofit show with a message and it means, I'm telling you, it means something to me every day in a different way. I hear it in a different way. And today it means something because it's talking about the health of our sector. And our message goes like this, to stay well so you can do well. Thank you so much. We'll see you back here for another episode.